Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. The situation in Australia continues to get more bizarre by the day. We did a story on this yesterday. We've pretty much been covering it daily. And we've all seen the images of the police, what I would consider brutality, uh, Australia turning into a totalitarian police state. But there are certain authoritarians in Australia, mostly those in the mainstream media, who contend that this is all fake news, that Australia is a, is a wonderfully free country right now as we speak. And any protest that you see or any issue with the police, it's all been edited by, that, by the right-wing extremists in the United States. And if you'd actually come down and talk to Australians, they think that life has never been better. Let's go to this article. This is from oh, New York Times. Shocker. No, Australia is not actually an evil dictatorship. as they show people protesting. So, starts off by, as you would expect, throwing Ron DeSantis under the bus. The Republican governor of Florida, who has made a name for himself as an extreme opponent of mandates, announced at the end of the last month that Australia was not a free country. This was surprising news to most all Australians. What seems the, the big disconnect here seems to be with my definition of free and this person's definition of free. See, I believe that if you live in a free country, that means that you can pretty much do as you please as long as you're not hurting another person directly. And if you do hurt another person, then that's something that should be settled in a court of law. You should be responsible for damages, what have you. It's not something that the government comes in and tries to pick winners and losers and tries to preventively come in and say, okay, we need these rules. We need to control the general population for the greater good by imposing our will and coercion. So, I would consider a free country one where their citizens can pretty much do as they please. There's private property rights. There's free market capitalism. And as long as you're not hurting someone else intentionally, then you're free to do what you want. And if you do hurt someone, then you take it up in a court of law. And the law applies equally to all individuals. It's not that the law applies to the average Joe and Jane, but doesn't apply to the politicians. It goes back to Animal Farm. Remember by Orwell? All animals are created equal, but some animals are more equal than others. But let's get back to this article. We mostly have spent pandemic lockdowns alternating between boredom, frustration, wine, and a lot of Netflix, and trying to locate our trousers before Zoom meetings. So again, how is this a free country when you are locked inside your house and you cannot leave? Think about the pretzel logic involved here, where admittingly, you cannot leave the house for, let's say, more than an hour or two a day, but yet you still claim that you live in a free country. Like, so you're, you're but okay, so let's, I was telling Josh before we went live, this was going to be a hard one to do because this frustrates me beyond belief. But let's just think through about what this person is saying or what would constitute a free country based on this person's definition. Would East Germany 
have been a free country? Well, let's go through what he's saying. Could the East Germans drink wine? Could they watch a movie? Could they go to meetings? Could they find their trousers? I think all those questions could be answered in the positive. So are we to assume that East Germany was a free country? Let's look at Germany in the 1930s. Even for the group who is selected by the political class as public enemy number one, could they do these things? Sure. How about if you lived in Stalinist Russia? Could you do these things? If you were a, a, a feudal serf in medieval times, could you do these things? Yes. This by no means means that you live in a free society. It's just, it's utterly bizarre that this person just says, oh, oh of course we're free. I mean, we just spend the days just not leaving the house, but bored and frustrated and just drinking wine. But yeah, we're totally free. <laughs> what are you right wing or extremists talking about? Again, the mental gymnastics required to come to this conclusion is staggering. Recently, we've also become aware of the disturbing myth that appears to be enthusiastically fostered on the American right. I, I, and I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure that nobody that wouldn't identify as someone on the extreme right would come to the same conclusion by looking at Australia and looking at the lockdowns where they've been in, in Melbourne, as an example, for over 200 days. I mean, do you really need to be on the American right to come to that conclusion? And then also in the very next, uh, in the very next sentence or the very next paragraph, they say last week, the myth of our enslavement propelled aspirational allies into the streets and States, Poland and Britain. Okay. So is that, are you saying the people in Poland are on the American right? Just none of this makes sense. Unless you're looking at it through the lens of some sort of authoritarian who's trying to put the most ridiculous spin on their situation down there. It, it, you know what this reminds me of? When I was down in Ecuador and first started spending time in South America, I read this news outlet called Telesur, I believe is what it was called. And I think it was a news outlet from... Uh, Venezuela. And you would read it and and they would spin what was happening to such a great degree that you, you you're like whoa what? Like they would spin hyperinflation as though it was a good thing. And you're like wait a minute. And, and when you read it it's like it, it kind of sounds like oh yeah well that hyperinflation I guess there's some positives to that. And you're like what what whoa time out time out. What what are you talking about? And that's the exact same thing that they're doing here. Or they would do the same thing for socialism. They would do the same thing in Australia for, for trying to justify locking people in a cage and not allowing them out. And then claiming that it's a free country. I mean, they didn't even go into the fact that Australians aren't even allowed to leave. The only way you can leave Australia is if you're have some sort of political favor or if you're a celebrity the average joe and jane can't leave so again i would ask this person how can you possibly define that as a free country there let's see here i'm skipping all if australians on twitter were confused about what they required saving from the sunshine, free health care, low cervicus sickness deaths. I, I mean, it is great that you've got sunshine down there. Too bad you can't go out of the house. I mean, do you sit there and, and enjoy the sunshine just looking out at it through the window while you're slamming your box of wine? That's freedom. And then they've got the audacity to sit here and say, they're propaganda, propaganda. 
that depicts Australia as a blasted hellscape is being generated and shared. Again, it's the exact same thing that they said about Stalinist Russia. The useful idiots. Oh, well, oh, well it's, this is just American propaganda. I, what are you talking about? There's, there's no unemployment here in Stalinist Russia. It's a wonderful place to live. Okay, so for the American audience, it seems to be part of international right-wing campaign to recruit those frustrated by lockdowns, unsure of medicines, and animated by appeals to personal liberty. You know, I, I said this on a couple videos today. I never in my life thought that I would have to argue to rational adults what the benefits of personal liberty and freedom were, or that I would have to actually stand up for liberty and freedom, that some people think it's just an antiquated idea, that they that they think liberty and they treat it like liberty and personal freedom as though it's some bastard stepchild that's over there in the corner. Oh, really? We honestly have to pay attention to that stupid personal liberty and freedom again. Are these dumb rubes going to bring up that nonsense? That's not even a debatable topic anymore. Serious adults, scholars, academics, people who are really professional, the intelligentsia, the enlightened one, they know that we shouldn't be even thinking about freedom and liberty. That's just some old school thought that died decades ago. That's really the way they view this. And my point is I never in my life thought that I would see that from the Western world, from, from people in Canada, in Australia, the United States, the UK. I mean, read a damn history book, for heaven's sakes. And then they go on to say how just amazing their life is in this state of being in jail. Australians, so all those Americans are just going on and on and on about their stupid personal liberty and freedom, where we Australians are really more focused on what really matters, and that's trying to get our kids to bed before watching some TV show. For months, I and other local disinformation researchers. Oh, here we go. <laughs> have watched the seeds of this campaign being spread across digital platforms. Uh, so here, what they're saying is that anything that you see that's negative about Australia is just photoshopped. It's just photoshopped fake news. So if you see you know, thousands of people uh, protesting what's happening there. That That's not really going on. It might have been like three or four people, but it's like the Koch brothers. They're the ones that are paying people to fly down to Australia and come out and protest. And then they're just saying that it's Australian. But really, Aus Australians, they're not protesting. We love lockdowns. We We love just sitting and not being able to do anything else other than drink wine and watch Netflix. That, that's pure freedom. We have the freedom to not have to go outside anymore. It's amazing. And then he talks about the Facebook groups that he monitors. How could you be proud of that? Honestly, how could you wake up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror, and say, you know what? I feel great about what I do. I, I censor free speech, man, and just pat yourself on the back. Oh, thank goodness. I'm, I'm censoring free speech. I, I'm really doing good today. I'm, I'm benefiting society by being a, a good, obedient censor. But think about looking yourself in the mirror every morning and saying that to yourself. How deranged do you need to be? I mean, is that not the definition of a sheeple? 
They go on to say these right wing American, and they keep saying right wing American influencers, but yet they talk about this, uh, about the whole world looking at them as though they're completely off their rocker. So they talk about Germany, they talk about Britain, they talk about Poland, but yet they, they, and they talk about this, but then when they're referencing it disparagingly, they always talk about American right wingers. I mean, give me a break. And again, it's like the only group that looks at them in utter horror horror is American right-wingers. I would argue that there is a large percentage of people on the left that look at them and say, what the hell are they doing? Hopefully the United States never goes that direction. I don't care if you're on the left or right. So then they start talking about these lockdown protests took place across Australia, attracting crowds in Sydney, Melbourne, yet this was no homegrown u- uprising. Data analysts found that protests had been coordinated by a central group of organizers based in Germany and Britain. So it's this conspiracy. It's this group that's conspiring against Australia. I would ask why? 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 Do you honestly think that Americans care about about maligning Australia, like the American right-wingers. They're like, oh, I know what we need to do today. Let's make Australia look terrible. Honestly, Australia, at a global level with Americans' lives, you're not that important. I hate to break it to you. I love Australians. I used to love Australia. I actually lived there uh, 2010, 2011, up on the Gold Coast in a place called Surfer's Paradise. But I can tell you right now that Australia would be no paradise. Uh, That's for sure. But my point is not to say that Australia isn't important. But my point is to say, come on, is are we really going to assume that all these people are exerting their mental bandwidth in other countries just in an effort to make Australia look like a police, uh, a totalitarian police state, even though it's not? Come on. As Australia's First Nations people knew, wasn't it a prison colony? I, this, let's seems how they've gone full circle here, but I digress. As Australia's First Nations people knew and settler colonial Australians learned on arrival, wait for it, individualism is far less useful than collaboration. Let, let me define that, or let me actually explain that to you. What he is saying is that individualism is bad. Collectivism, though, is good. And that Australians learned that a long, long time ago. And you dumb American right-wingers, you should just realize that. And the fact that you're not acknowledging that collectivism is far better than individualism means that you're just not paying attention to reality. I want to bring up someone that I've got a lot of respect for. And I said I was going to bring up in the last video and I didn't. Gentleman's name is Milton Friedman. And he sheds light on why it's important to look at the individual first. But he's doing this in a speech where he's talking about the the humane side of capitalism. But it's really about the humane side of treating people as an every person as an individual. And when you prioritize the individual above the collective, that is when a society prospers. Go back throughout history and look at the societies that have tried to prioritize the collective group. It never ends well. In fact, usually it ends in genocide. And if you think through why, it really makes sense. Because how on earth can something that benefits the collective also benefit every individual? Because we're all different, you see? And that's why it never works. Because it requires human beings to all be the same. And that is completely antithetical to the way we are hardwired. We are hardwired with different beliefs, 
with different priorities, with different likes and different dislikes. Therefore, when we try to make everyone the same, like this person is saying, that it should be a one size fits all approach, that's when you actually take the level of fairness in society and completely destroy it. That's the irony. But let's get into what Milton Friedman says. Let me turn up the volume here. The morality that is relevant to each of us in our private life, how we each individually conduct ourselves, behave. And then what's relevant to systems of government and organization are the relations between people. And in judging relations among between people, I do not believe that the fundamental value is to do good to others, whether they want you to or not. The fundamental value is not to do good to others as you see their good. It's not to force them to do good. As I see it, the fundamental value in relations to Hmong people is to respect the dignity and the individuality of fellow men. To treat your fellow man not as an object to be manipulated for your purpose but to treat him as a person with his own values and his own rights, a person to be persuaded, not coerced, not forced, not bulldozed, not brainwashed. There you go. So if you guys couldn't hear, basically what he's saying is that if you move into this idea of a, a collectivist society where that's the number one priority, you're going to wipe out the individual priorities or that you're going to wipe out the priorities of the individual themselves and ethically that's completely immoral that what we have to do is we have to allow the individuals to make their own decisions that's what's ethically correct that's what's moral that's what our principles should dictate because in the long run that's what's going to be most beneficial to society at large it's when people come in and start saying, oh, we need to do this for the greater good. But what Milton Friedman says is who's going to determine what the greater good is? Because the greater good for this guy might not be the greater good for that guy. And that's what this person in Australia totally misses. See, he doesn't understand or he chooses to ignore the fact that if the group is making a decision for each individual, then over time, each one of those individuals is going to have something happened to them that is antithetical or the opposite really of what they want. And that's not going to be fair to that person or the group. See that that's really where this leads. Let's continue. Let's go back to the article here. So now they go ahead and admit that, yes, Australia's lockdowns have seemed indeterminable to all of us. Cold, crowded Melbourne recently passed the sad record of the most days in lockdown of any city in the world. Many, including me, have been cut off from my loved ones by the stringent restrictions. But yet this is the guy saying that life is good. Here in Australia, this is a free country. What are you talking about? Anyone that would say anything else is just being manipulated by right wingers in America. But the reality that eludes the propagandists is that Australia's extended lockdowns are not a ploy for government control, but a failure of it. This is where it gets really good. So he says that the lockdowns don't represent a totalitarian police state, or authoritarianism. The lockdowns represent a lack of authoritarianism. If we just would have been more of a totalitarian police state at the beginning, then we wouldn't have to deal with these lockdowns in the first place. That's their argument. I, I mean, you just can't make this up. It's, it's astonishing that anyone could have this position. 
and here's their rationale, if you want to call it that. A bumbling Australian federal government did not secure an adequate initial supply of medicines in the uh, in the window of time before the arrival of the variant. Okay, prior, who infamously uh, on holiday while the uh, while the country was on fire. Okay, the variant uh, circulated and the lockdowns restarted. Yet Australia remains a free country. So what he's saying is that the government didn't take enough action or they took the wrong action. They didn't have enough of the of the medicine and therefore they have to go into all of these lockdowns. And because of government incompetence, then they had to become a totalitarian police state. But the fact that they're a totalitarian police state isn't bad, it's good, and it just proves that Australia is a free country. <laughs> Follow that logic if you can. After all, Australia's lockdowns, masks, and social distancing have kept total nationwide deaths from the uh, survey sickness under 1,500. And then he contrasts that to Florida, which has lost 57,000. It's that cold reality, the propaganda, lurid and outlandish and ridiculous, seeks to banish, but it can't. All right. So on that note, if you guys have been following me on Twitter, I've said on this channel quite a few times that you can't just look at the amount of deaths. What you have to do is you have to look at the years lost, not just the lives lost. The average age of death in Australia, 82 years old. So let's just assume those people would have lived another five years, giving them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. And let's just assume that based on their uh, population, they would have had a, a similar uh, death rate to Florida. So we'll just say 50,000 just to make the math easy, five years each. That means they would have lost a total of 250,000 years, right? So what I'm doing is I'm taking the 50,000 lives that most likely that they say they would have lost. OK, and, and then assuming that each one of those people would have had optimistically would have had another five years of life, even though the average age was 82. And then you take the five years times the 50,000, that gives you 250,000 years lost total. All right. Well, let's think about this. Let's say half the country has been in a state of lockdown for a year, meaning the only thing they could do, even according to this person that says Australia is a free country. The only thing they could do is drink wine, watch Netflix, and just look at the sun through a window and become massively depressed. All right, is that not losing a year of your life? And if it's not, how would you define that? If you went to prison for five years, would you say that you lost five years of your life? I think almost every single person would say yes, absolutely. So if that's the case, then we, we can say half the Australian population has lost a year of their life. Well, that's 12.5 million people. So what you've done is you've saved optimistically, giving them the benefit of the doubt, 250,000 years, but the price you've paid to save those years is 12.5 million. See, this is what our wonderful censor man isn't acknowledging. And it's something they're not even thinking through. And I would take it a step further because he's assuming that the 1500, as though that just is going to, that trend is going to continue indefinitely into the future. But what that would assume is that you can eradicate the surveys of sickness. And you can't. So what's going to happen is, event, or maybe not, but eventually let's just assume that they lift the restrictions, even if they have, let's say, an 80% rate of medicine taking. What's going to happen? You're going to have a situation just like uh, Israel, where the cervasa sickness spreads right through the community because you can still spread it. And although the Negative consequences, let's say, might be lower because the rate of medicine is higher. 
you're still going to have, at some point in time, everyone get the cerveza sickness. Unless you can come up with some brand new medicine that gives sterilizing immunity. Meaning that you take it and then even if you, I'm trying to do this YouTube friendly, even if you get the cerveza sickness, you cannot transmit the cerveza sickness to someone else. And right now that's not a possibility. So this is a complete pipe dream. What I'm saying is that sure, you might have 1,500 now, but once you open back up, if you ever do, then you're going to go up to that 50,000 uh, person mark. But then, so you've had, you get the exact same result, but you have, yet you have to pay all these costs in the interim. And this person knows, noticeably said nothing about the destruction of the economy, nothing about the suicide rate, nothing about the rates of alcoholism, nothing about what this is doing psychologically to all these kids that are growing up that can't see any facial expressions, nor can they even go outside. They can't go to the local playground. You think that's not having an impact? How about the small and mid-sized mid businesses that have been completely wiped out? Is, is that, why should we not calculate that into the cost-benefit analysis? See, this is pure madness. And again, I cannot believe that I'm, actually having to point this out to grown adults in 2021. I, I never, growing up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, I never in my life thought we would get to this point in the West where this was even debatable on why we should value freedom and liberty and individualism. But here we are. All right, so super chat here. We got George, what's your take on karma as the ultimate, oh, here, Josh, put that back. Is the ultimate currency we contribute to the S&P 500 blindly in hopes of easy money and expect it to be free? Yeah, I yeah, I mean, I think there's a point there, Justin. I don't know if I'd consider that karma, but I do consider it, I, I don't think it's kind of mystical. Well, and that's kind of where I'd put the the term karma, not saying that it's real or not real, but it, it's just kind of, uh, I guess mystical is the best word I can find. I, I like to look at it more in terms of mathematics, that uh, if you continue to just invest blindly, to your point, in hopes of easy money, you don't have a mathematical edge. And over the long run, you're going to lose money. You're most likely going to go bust. So is, is that karma or is that math? Or maybe it's one and the same. <laughs> so I totally agree. It's just that you may look at it as karma, but I just look at it as a numbers game. Yeah, that's right. So Fat Vegan, P-H-A-T, says America is on the heels of Australia. That, that's why I'm talking about this stuff. Really, I mean, I, I've the last few days I've done videos on Australia, and it's to wake up. It's not just to try to rile up the people in Australia. That's that's not. I mean, I want to support them to the best of my ability because we all have to stand up. The one thing that unites us all is people who believe in individual sovereignty, that believe in liberty and freedom. So that that's an idea. That's not a geographical location. So we need to stand up as a community of like-minded individuals and stand up against this tyrannical author authoritarian viewpoint that we see that's prevalent right now in the West. So that's the main reason I'm doing that. But it's also to, to just wake up Americans and, and people, other people living in the West that, hey, if we're not careful, if we don't have a sense of urgency, if we don't get off this road to serfdom, we're going to wake up and we're going to be in the exact same position that Australia is in now. Because if you would have gone back to 2019 and I would have said, hey, is Australia about as free as the United States? You said, yeah, sure, absolutely. And if I would have told you in 2019 that Australia would be where it is today, just a year and a half later, 
you would have told me I was crazy. You, you would have thought that was something from, from Alex Jones. Something like that, you know, the tinfoil hatter. And by the way, let's acknowledge a lot of what Alex Jones was talking about. Now, it's just mainstream, but put that to a, to the side. You'd have called me a tinfoil hatter. You'd have called me an extremist. I'm fear-mongering, all these things. And sure enough, look at Australia now. In, in, in less than a year and a half, they have gone to what we would consider a free country to, 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 to now what this censored dude considers a free country, which is basically just being locked in a cage, drinking wine and watching Netflix. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening. Make sure that you're always standing up fighting for freedom, especially now it is vitally important as this article from Australia and this censor guy shows us. Enjoy that evening, guys. Enjoy the afternoon. I'll see you on the next video.